everyone. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. We're happy to have you this evening. Tonight's guest is Joshua Werman. He works at the Center for Severe Weather Research. And uh, you may have seen Josh on a few storm chasing shows on TV. We're going to talk a little bit about that as well tonight with all the research he's been doing lately with the active tropical season and just kind of generally talking about his career. So uh, we're happy to have Josh with us tonight. Towards the end of the show, we'll let Josh give out uh, some information, social media websites. Uh, that way you can follow more of his uh, content. Um, so be uh, sure to stick around towards the end of the show for that. So Josh, uh, welcome to the show. We're happy to have you. Uh, we'll kind of give you our, uh, our, our first question that we ask all of our first time guests is how did you get hooked into this uh, this crazy weather world that we all like to follow? Well, it's been decades for me. You can see all the gray hair here. Uh, as a kid, uh, I loved physics and math and things like that. And uh, weather was just always a passion for me. I had a little weather station in my backyard and one of those little Taylor instruments, max min thermometers and a weather station. Um, you know, I was old school before the internet. Um, so I always liked weather. It was changing all the time. Uh, and it was just a great way to apply my nerdy passions of, of physics and math uh, to something that was really interesting. A lot of interesting challenges and problems still to be solved. Um, so one way or another, I've been into weather for 50 years. So Josh, before you got started with the Dow projects um, and everything that you've been working on recently, you actually used to work with the Air Force on nuclear winter um, simulations, I guess you could say. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? that? That's something I knew nothing about before um, doing a quick Google search yesterday. Wow, I was gonna say somebody had some old resume out there. Um, <laughs> I, I went to school, uh, I went to MIT, was kind of nerdy. Um, I dropped out for three years. Um, so, you know, do what I say, not what I do, but I dropped out of school for three years. Uh, and went to work as a consultant uh, for the Air Force Geophysics Laboratories. Um, and there was a group there that was working on uh, modeling of a nuclear winter. Uh, there was a pretty hot topic back in the, in the 80s. Um, and the, uh, the premise basically was that if uh, nuclear bombs, if a lot of nuclear bombs were dropped, um, this was a different world back then. We were really thinking about the Soviet Union and the fact that some giant nuclear war would happen with thousands of nuclear bombs dropped. Um, and the concern was that these nuclear weapons would waft a lot of dust and smoke um, up into the stratosphere where it would last a long time. Um, and so what we were doing uh, in that group was taking uh, normal thunderstorm cloud models, similar though more primitive because it was 30 years ago, um, but similar to models that are run now on clouds and we would instead of initiating a cloud with a two or three degree warm bubble from turbulence, we would initiate, initiate the model, initialize the model with a 500 degree nuclear explosion and boom, you get a big cloud. Um, and we would look at how high uh, the dust from the ground and how high the smoke and, and other things would be, would be lofted uh, into the stratosphere. You could see what the effects would be on, on blocking off the sun, what was the issue. And so the concern then was that a nuclear war might lead to what, uh, what was called then, probably still is, a nuclear winter. Josh, it seems like you've done a lot of work with radars. What, what kind of interest uh, when, when you were uh, trying to figure out what, what you liked and didn't like in the, in the weather community, what kind of drew you to, to radars and, and radar coverage and information? I got into radar uh, as a graduate student. Um, and the group I was working in was working a lot with radar. I was working with radar data. Um, my uh, PhD work was on microbursts, um, looking at radar data. Um, and I just started asking some technical questions. Uh, most radars work by sending microwaves out. You send a pulse of microwaves out, and then what comes back to you is what you measure. Um, that's how almost all radars are working. Um, but I just asked myself one day, I'm, I think literally this was a in the shower kind of mental conversation, um, what happens to all the other stuff? You know, some, radar, some of the radiation hits the raindrops and comes back, but a lot of it goes other directions. What, what happens to all that? Um, and so uh, it turns out really interesting things happen to that and you can measure that. Uh, so I, I basically came up with this concept of what's called bi-static 
multiple Doppler systems. That's a lot of syllables. But it was just a different way of doing radar. And I kind of got into doing some radar technology. Um, and in the process of getting more, that kind of led to another question uh, once I was doing that kind of technology. Um, by the way, those in the field think that was my most clever idea, not the, the doubt. I was just reading papers about people who were doing tornado chasing. This was in early 90s. Uh, so there certainly were scientists who were doing tornado chasing. Um, there were scientists who were taking out what I'll call some pretty primitive radar type devices to, to look at those tornadoes. Um, and I thought, well, what if you actually put a good radar near a tornado, what would you see? Um, so it was just asking that kind of simple question, and how could you do that? Um, so I had what, in retrospect, wasn't a great idea of putting a, a radar in a van, just a regular old passenger van, with an antenna in the back, and you would open the back doors and expose the antenna, and literally we would just do donuts in a parking lot to scan. It wouldn't scan. We would just do donuts <laughs> facing the tornado. That was my original idea. Um, and uh, we would just do donuts and see if we could take some slices through a tornado. Um, that quickly morphed into, you know, some engineers telling me, you know, you can actually make that antenna move. Um, and here's how to do it uh, into coming up with the first Doppler on wheels. Uh, and I usually describe it as an idea behind its time, you know, but it's not rocket science. Um, the first Doppler on wheels was just a weather radar. We did a few slightly clever technological things to make it fit on a truck and make it not break when you drive it over railroad tracks. But basically it was a radar on a small box van. Um, and the main thing is we just got closer. Uh, so we just drove it up to tornado. So we had a pretty good radar, not as good as an 88D, but a pretty good radar. And uh, by getting it 50 times closer, um, we had a 50 times smaller beam that way. We had a 50 times smaller beam that way. So it's already 2,500 times better. We were a little bit clever and sampled in the third direction better. But I could get 10,000 pieces of data where an 88D would typically get one. And, you know, if you have a microscope or telescope or something, it's getting 10,000 times better data. Um, it's easy to get new science out of that. And that's what we did. The whole thing was just getting closer getting finer scale data, looking with a better microscope, with a better telescope um, at, at tornadoes and anything else. I, I know you mentioned tropical stuff and we just came back from Sally and Laura. Well, we got in the eyes of those storms, in the eye walls of those storms and with a better microscope, we got up close. Uh, and so we're seeing lots of things you just can't see from farther away uh, with our technology. I guess for the, for the viewers and the listeners who aren't as uh, familiar with what the Doppler on wheels looks like and kind of, you know, what is the epitome of that now? I guess some basic descriptions of uh, what it's like having a Doppler on wheels, what's the size of it and kind of what's the situations that you would prefer to drive it into? Are there other things besides uh, scanning tornadoes and hurricanes that you find it useful for? Sure. So let me start out. I'll back up one step and start just in case there's some people who don't even really have a great feel of what radars do. I mean, radars basically send out a narrow beam. It's kind of like a flashlight beam, um, as narrow as you can get it. And they're scanning through storms of whatever type and trying to get the, the smallest details that you can by scanning that flashlight beam back and forth. Uh, the Doppler on wheels is basically putting all that radar stuff and that flashlight on a truck so we get closer to things. Um, I was just explaining how if you get 50 times closer, you're getting maybe 10,000 times better data. So anything we drive it closer to, we're seeing better data. Um, I use an analogy sometimes of whoever it was who invented the first microscope. So he points it at his finger. He can see details of a fingerprint. Uh, he can point it at pond water and sees paramecians. Um, you can, almost anything you point it at, you're going to see much finer scale detail. So that's what we do with these Doppler on wheels on trucks. So the fundamental concept is just a pretty good radar. Um, actually, lately, we've made very good radars on trucks. Um, so the first ones were just pretty good radars on trucks. Um, what we've done is we've made our trucks better, but we've also made the radars a lot better. So now we have dual polarization radar. So we can see 
the difference between hail and rain if they're making, you know, rain has sort of kind of hamburger shaped raindrops, whereas hail is these big ugly things that are tumbling. We can tell the difference <coughs> with dual polarization. Um, we have two different frequencies, so we can look at what happens at two different frequencies. We also have um, pretty good if you're driving over railroad tracks, like I was talking about, if one frequency goes down, we still have the other one. So it's just more reliable. Um, so we've done a lot to make the radars better. Um, getting closer is great for tornadoes. We can make maps of tornadoes and multiple vortices and what's happening near the ground, all kinds of stuff you just couldn't see before, just like looking at a paramecium in a pond. But that's true of all kinds of different phenomena. Um, we've had these radars up on mountain peaks in Idaho and Wyoming for winter storm projects where we're looking at what happens uh, with snow bands and what happens with snow bands when you see them in really remote areas. Well, for a radar that's 100 miles away in Boise, you can't see what's happening in that remote area, Idaho. But we put the radar right on the mountains where we're doing the seeding and we can see what's happening close up. Um, we just took the radars, um, well, just a year and a half ago. We took them down to South America to look at storms down there. Um, and by getting up close and targeting those storms, we can see the small scale details of what's happening. Um, they weren't making tornadoes pretty much. They were just making big hail, actually huge hail, um, and torrential rain, just horrible flooding. Some of the biggest, strongest storms are happening down in uh, Argentina, northern Argentina. Um, we've taken the trucks up to New England to look at coastal storms there and watching all the small scale details and banding and other phenomena that we don't even understand what they are. We're still trying to get funding to go study what those things, we've seen some things we don't understand. And so uh, what our normal course of action is, we see something we don't understand, then we go and ask the government, can we have some money so we can go do this better and understand it? So we're still in that middle phase right now where we're trying to get the money to go do the project better to understand it. Um, we just went to Hurricanes Laura and Hurricane uh, Sally. Um, and we're trying to get in the eyes of those hurricanes to see the small scale details. Uh, after, uh, so I invented the first Dow back in late 94 and 95, got some hurricane data in 95. Um, in 96, I just thought, hey, I wonder what you'd see if you went inside a hurricane. Nobody had ever, I know now hurricane chasing with, with chasers, recreational chasers is reasonably popular. And there's several scientific teams that do that. Back then, 1996, no one did that. The idea was basically a, a hurricane was a zone of death. You just don't go in. Um, but we thought, well, it's not so much worse than an RFD or something. Maybe we can do it, right? So we went in really kind of scared. We're pretty anxious. And we went to Hurricane Fran back in 1996. We deployed, I think, five miles from the coast, really far from the coast, something I just wouldn't do by choice anymore, um, and deployed on a runway at Wilmington Airport, really scared. We had all these emergency ideas of running into the shelter at the airport if anything bad happened, if we flipped over or went airborne. We just didn't know what would happen. Um, but we got amazing data. We discovered a whole new phenomenon. It turns out the wind in hurricanes doesn't just blow straight. It's actually blowing like a corkscrew. Um, there's these boundary layer rolls, uh, and those rolls are mixing strong winds down to the ground where you get these streaks of stronger winds. Um, but over the ocean in particular, it's mixing the warm soupy air up uh, from the ocean surface and feeding the storm um, and measuring that flux of not only momentum downwards, but warmth energy upwards is really important, critical for these hurricane intensification models. Um, if you've noticed, from actually Sally and from Laura, um, the track forecasts are pretty good. Even two or three days ahead of time, you pretty much know where that storm's gonna go, but you don't know what the intensity is gonna be that well. And rapid intensifications happen both in Laura and in Sally right before landfall um, that were, weren't really that well forecast. Um, so understanding that core screwing is really important. So just by going in, we discovered a whole new phenomena, which was quite exciting for us uh, going into a, a hurricane. You know, how do you deal with the, um, the potential for, you know, radiation issues um, coming off of the radar? Because obviously you don't want to be in the dome of an 88D while it's running. Um, I'm pretty su sure similar situations with the Dow. You don't want to be right in front of it, obviously. How do you all, is there is anything special you have to do to mitigate that? So um, in very loose terms, radiation comes in two types. Um, one is ionizing radiation. The other is non-ionizing radiation. 
Um, ionizing radiation is basically ultraviolet and shorter wavelengths. So ultraviolet X-rays, gamma rays, things of that sort. Um, and those hurt you because the individual photons hit your DNA, ionize it, change the molecular structure, um, and then you get mutations and cancers. Um, not, but that only, only ultraviolet and stronger uh, or shorter wavelengths, you know, higher energy photons can do that. Um, Non-ionizing ra uh, radiation, which is visible, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, um, those can also cause harm. Um, what those do is they interact, they don't actually hit the electrons and knock them off the DNA molecule. What a microwave or a radio wave or an infrared coming off your fireplace does is it shakes your molecules, mostly your water molecules, and it makes your water molecules shake and bend and do things like that. Um, and then those water molecules, the bending and stuff and shaking is not so bad, but what happens is then they, um, as they lose that energy, they heat things up. That energy basically degrades into heat. Um, so the way a microwave oven hurts you um, would be if you got heated up, um, if it heated your tissue. Um, and in theory, a radar or a microwave or something like that could heat your tissue and hurt you if it raised your body temperature. So if it heated up your eyeballs or your brain or your liver or something up to some dangerous temperature, that would be bad for you. Um, but it, it takes a lot of energy to do that. Now, um, and a lot of energy focused in a small area to do that. So your microwave basically makes about a kilowatt of energy, but it's focused on a, a small area like that to heat up your, your muffin, right? Um, or whatever you're trying to do. Uh, a radar, so let's say the Dow's, um, they might put out on the average a kilowatt or two kilowatts of energy, um, but it's spread over this huge dish. Um, so in fact, an 88D, I would stand in front of the dish of an 88D. It would not heat me up that bad because sure, it's putting out an average of a kilowatt. It puts out a megawatt for a microsecond, but on the average, you know, it does that a thousand times a second. On the average, it's putting out about a kilowatt. Now that kilowatt compressed in this much space, if you put your hand on the waveguide of the 88D or a Dow, it would be like holding a light bulb. It would hurt you because of that heat. Um, you know, well, actually old style light bulbs. See, now I'm gonna date myself. Not these LEDs you kids use, you know, the old incandescent light bulbs like we used to use. Um, but yeah, an old incandescent light bulb, if you held it, it would hurt you, right? But if you stood two meters away, it would not hurt you. The brightest light bulb two meters away is not gonna hurt you. Pretty much these radars, when you're a couple meters away, like an 88D or a Dow, are not gonna hurt you by heating you up enough. Um, now, there can be exceptions. There are some military radars which have more power if you got super close to them. I think cell phone towers, microwave links. There's some things where you can get an energy density that's pretty high. And if it's an energy density that's enough to heat up your eyeballs or interior, you know, several degrees, like a fever, um, then that would cause harm. Um, but in general, um, we don't believe, the best medical knowledge that we have is that this low degree of heating from 88Ds, from Dows, from things like that, um, from light bulbs, from standing out in the sun, you know, you get heating from standing out in the sun, um, probably doesn't hurt you. Um, now, that said, um, as with anything, if you Google on the internet, um, and there's six billion people out there, you'll find some people who have some alternate theories about anything, right? Um, Google Flat Earth Society, if you want to, you know, prove that theory. Um, and so there are people who believe that these pulses and things like that can cause harm in some other ways. Um, I don't think they're right. Um, there really isn't medical evidence that they're right, but there are some concerns over that. Um, I had a question. I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit uh, away from hurricanes and tornadoes and maybe talk a little bit about your work with lake effect snow. Um, <laughs> I was curious just, uh, you know, how is the, the DOWs used to uh, look at lake effect snowstorms and what are some of your favorite places to set up along the Great Lakes? 
So we did two uh, lake effect snowstorm studies um, in the last several years. Uh, the most recent was called OWL, which I forget what it stands for, Ontario something, lake effect snow. And um, they were fascinating, fascinating to me. I, I was really interested. I'd never, I, I'd grown up in the East Coast and so, you know, been up there a little bit and seen some lake effect snow, but not, not really experienced it in that way. Uh, we based in Oswego, New York, um, and the idea was to look at Lake Ontario um, lake effect. You know, lake effect snow happens, uh, I'll say very, very loosely, you know, cold air comes over warm lake, you get moisture and heat coming up from the lake and you get uh, convection. Lake Ontario is, is deeper. Uh, lake Ontario, Lake Erie get a lot of lake effect, but Lake Erie freezes over in the winter and basically that, that warmth and moisture coming up stops, uh, so the lake shuts off. Um, Lake Ontario is deeper, uh, has more mixing, so it stays, you know, open for business, they say, uh, for, for most, most of the winter, uh, usually the whole winter. Um, so we based in uh, Oswego, which was on the southeast side of the lake, um, and with the Dalles, we could operate different places along the lake. So we went as far west as Buffalo, um, as far east as the Canadian border, um, up on the northeastern side of Lake Ontario. Um, and what we did the fall before the project is we scouted out lots of potential sites where we could park our radars. Uh, we had three radars up there um, and we were trying to operate them in triplets to triangulate on the different parts of the storm. And depending on the forecasts, we would drive to site one, two, and three or site 15, 16, 17, wherever it was along the lake and then scan there for the, uh, for the duration of the storms. Um, Sometimes it was a bust and the bands didn't happen where we thought they would. Sometimes it was, it was pretty amazing. These bands would happen right there. Um, and very impressive snow. Um, you get these, it was kind of windy. Um, we were always right along the lake. So it was particularly windy, 30, 40 knot winds sometimes. Um, and so we had these ground blizzard conditions, very low visibility. Um, not a lot of moisture, uh, you know, huge snow ratios, 20 to one kind of thing. Um, but it would just be blowing like crazy. So you just, you couldn't see anything. Um, and the snow rates, you know, we, I remember one day, you know, we're getting six inches an hour. I mean, it's just, you can't believe that. I, mean, I couldn't, it's just amazing amounts of snow coming down. Um, again, over the course of the winter, it wasn't like there was eight feet of snow on the ground. It would kind of compress between storms because it was such fluffy stuff. Um, but, uh, but these bands were, were, were quite impressive. Um, some of the bands had uh, little cells in them, which almost looked like miniature supercells. We, we get these little uh, meso vortices, or what we call them miso vortices, M-I-S-L, because they were pretty small, a kilometer or so in scale. Um, weaker than tornadoes, but these pretty pronounced uh, spin-ups. Uh, so we were mapping those out. Um, it seemed like those were associated with some enhancements in the snow and different and changes in the type of snow crystals. Um, so those were pretty interesting. So Josh, as we wrap this up tonight, um, let's just talk briefly about some of your TV appearances. Um, people may remember you from the Discovery Channel show Storm Chasers and uh, other shows that you're on. So let's talk about some of those experiences and uh, any memorable moments from those shows. <laughs> yeah, so tornado work, you know, that gets you know, off and on, kind of ebbs and flows, gets a lot of uh, media attention um, at times. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, it's dynamic, it's people out there next to danger. You know, we just were, sorry, I was going on at great length again about, you know, potential risks and dangers in, in El Reno. Um, Discovery Channel was a very different character of show because instead of just doing a documentary type of thing like we've done with History Channels and Nat Geos and, um, and Novas, um, they wanted to film something which was kind of documentary-like, but then evolved into being more reality show-like um, and multiple seasons of reality show. And so um, that was an interesting tr kind of thing to do. Um, I think both cultures uh, struggled with that. I think we managed to do some things which were worthwhile. Um, Discovery Channel funded and supported a lot of our science, um, and they stuck with us during on certain seasons where we weren't getting a lot of data, um, but other seasons where we got good things. Um, I think we were probably very difficult. You know, reality shows thrive on people who want to be on TV and who want to act up. And it's known that 
the more crazy you are and the most more outrageous and the more you scream or have fights or do whatever, the more you're going to be on TV and the more it's going to be interesting. Um, that is the opposite of what boring scientists like me want to do. I mean, we are just not into that. Um, and so getting enough interesting TV out of people like me, I think is a real challenge. Um, dealing with people who are trying to make a drama show and not do serious business <laughs> like I want to do um, is a challenge for us. Um, but that, that, that match was made um, and it worked pretty well. Now, eventually I think they got tired of us. You know, they, we, we were in there a lot in seasons one and two. And then in season three, they were trying to bring in more interesting people. And then whatever, season four, I don't know if I'm catching these seasons right, but you know, we basically were out of it. Maybe we made some cameo appearances, but um, they just wanted more exciting uh, chaser type activity and the, and the science aspect wasn't as important to them. Um, I, I wish they kept doing science more, but that's not what sell, you know, they're trying to sell pickup trucks and, you know, and pills or, you know, whatever, whoever advertises on, uh, on, on Discovery Channel, it's, it's a business. Um, so I'm sure they were making commercially sensible choices um, for, for what's good there. Um, as we were making choices for what was good for our science. I mean, we didn't care about pickup trucks. What we cared about was getting good data. Um, so it, it, it was interesting um, working with that. For those who are listening or watching the podcast or the, the live stream, um, if folks want to learn more about what you guys are doing with the Dow Project and all the other things you're doing, how, how can they do that? Do you have social media website um, our folks can uh, follow? So um, first, because I'm old, <laughs> um, but, but second, actually, because of Discovery Channel, I basically don't do social media. So first of all, my phone number here at home is not under my name. Uh, I don't have a Facebook page. Um, the problem was just, I think they had 3 million people watching that show. Let's say one out of a thousand of them are crazy, right? Mm. I don't want emails or Facebook or stalking or, you know, phone calls from that one in a thousand who are crazy. So I basically never got involved with any of that sort of thing. Um, that's so old, it probably wouldn't matter anymore. Um, but so how can they do it? I mean, we have a very, we're just not good at publicizing our stuff. We have a bad web page that's mostly out of date. Every so often we update it with something. I think we put some Hurricane Laura stuff on it. Um, like I said, I don't do Facebook. Maybe some of my team members do. We are just we're, I don't know, boomers. Um, we don't do that kind of thing much. I will say this. I'll give you a plug for your website. It's CSWR.org. And uh, I do see the article there about the, uh, the Dow's being deployed during Hurricane Laura. So if you want to check out the website, um, in fact, that's how I got in touch with you, Josh. So oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, check that out. So, uh, but we appreciate yeah, Go ahead. Sure. I said that's, that's the best formal thing is that website and I try, I don't even do it. I, I, I mean, actually, back in the day, I used to actually type HTTP, which also was probably a boomer thing. But I, I, I have somebody on my team and I say, hey, put some link to our Washington Post article on there if you can. So sometimes we get some things like that. Um, maybe there's something about our fire, but you know, so we went to this camera and fire and got data. And I don't know if that's on our webpage. I don't know how you find out about it. I mean, <laughs> we're just not good at publicizing ourselves. No we, we, we need we need some influencers on our team. I <laughs> well, hey, I know a group right here that would love to help you out. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, so Josh, we appreciate the work that you and your team do and uh, the valuable research that uh, you provide to all of us here in the weather community. Uh, we appreciate you joining us tonight, and uh, we hope you stay safe out there the next time you venture out into hurricanes or tropical storms or uh, tornadoes or up this upcoming winter storms. Uh, we wish you the best out there and uh, we'll stay in touch. Okay. Thanks. It was great talking to you. Terrific questions, all of you. Uh, it, it was fun to answer those and uh, I'm happy to answer others or, or do something like this again, whenever uh, you guys are interested. Thank you guys for watching the Carolina Weather Group. We hope you have a great evening here next week.